copy to my mother after this. I know she'll appreciate it. <laughs> Let me know what kind of feedback you get from her. All right, Donna, let's start off. Uh, in your book, In Appeal to Reason, 204 Strategic Tools to Help You Win Your Appeal at Trial, uh, you talk a little bit about the role of attorneys in the appellate process. I'm not an appellate attorney. I don't want to be an appellate attorney. Why should I care as a trial lawyer what the role of, of a trial lawyer is in the appellate process? What difference does it really make? Well, you do serve an important role because, first of all, you create my record. I don't create a record. I mean, I can pick and choose which documents go into a transcript, but ultimately, I look to you to create a record. And sometimes you might know not know what needs to be in that record. So you need to contact me and talk before, uh, like say you get a motion for summary judgment. It's probably very helpful to have me look at it and say, what do I need to, to do to, to oppose this motion? And it could be a demur. What do I need to oppose this demur? Should I just amend and not worry about fighting it? Should I fight it? How do I best present this appeal for the appellate court? So you're talking about instances during litigation before the trial actually starts, and that raises a good question. When should a litigator think about bringing someone like you into a case, and at what point during the litigation process, based upon your 30 years of experience, do you start to see important, substantial appellate issues begin to materialize? Is it at the, at the date of filing, at the first law in motion hearing date? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it depends. One, it depends on what type of case you have. If it's a big injury case and it's very simple, maybe you don't want someone brought in right away. If it's a um, complex case, then you certainly want someone brought in right away. Like let's say you've taken a medical malpractice case, and most of us realize that uh, as the plaintiff, you're going to be hit with a motion for summary judgment at some point. So from the very beginning, you're already thinking about how do I de defeat that uh, motion that's going to come down the road. Now, let's say you take a case and you research it and you go, I don't know if I have standing. This is kind of a novel theory. Well, you're probably going to be challenged at the demur stage. So you're going to want to bring somebody in then. And then if you're at trial and, you know, let's say you have problems with your jury instructions or your special verdict form, and especially your motions for a new trial, then yes, you should bring an appellate attorney. Now, when, uh, when filing the initial pleadings, when doing the initial work in the litigation process, preparing a case for trial, Obviously, issues come up that you've just shared where there may be appellate issues that need to be addressed uh, early rather than later. At what point during the litigation process does credibility of a lawyer, does the credibility of opposing counsel, uh, even the credibility of a judge, does that ever come into play during the appellate process? Oh, God, yes. I, I, I really try to protect my credibility with the court. And that starts even at the uh, superior court level how you deal with the clerks, because the clerks, the bailiff, they talk to the judge, uh, you know, during breaks or they go to lunch, and you don't want to mistreat them and have the judge find out about it. When you go in for a case management conference, uh, you're showing your credibility there because somewhere down the road you may want a continuance. Um, for a motion for summary judgment, you may need a continuance for discovery disputes, and certainly when you're faced with sanctions, you want to have your credibility uh, perfect every step of the way because everybody finds out about it. For instance, if you lie to a judge or you misrepresent the facts, do you think that judge doesn't tell other judges? People hear about it. So you have to really work on preserving your reputation. It d does that apply to appellate attorneys, too, when arguing in front of the appellate courts? In other words, you're telling the justices one thing, the other appellate attorney is telling the justices something else. How important is your credibility 
as opposed to what they're reading or reviewing in the written record? Well, I personally think it's very important. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that just because I'm credible, I win a case. I mean, it just, uh, you know, I've been told by justices that when they get an appeal, they look to see who the judge is, and then they look to see who the appellate attorney is. So that has to have some importance. And sometimes when, uh, let's say you're preparing a brief, and you miscite to the record or you, um, you know, cite from dissents or, and you don't indicate it's a dissenting opinion or the case has been overruled, once you've done that and you've been discovered, and, and you will be, you lose credibility and that means that you're creating more work because now they have to check every single thing they do. It doesn't mean that you necessarily win or lose the case, but sometimes it can, I think it can make a difference, especially if you want something from the court like a continuance or you request supplemental briefing or things of that sort. You know, I was asking you that question because I've been told in the past that all, the only thing that really matters on appeal is what's within the four corners of the document or the items that are presented to the appellate court. But what I'm hearing from you is, is there is a bit more involved uh, with respect to the uh, credibility of appellate counsel for uh, tangent reasons, whether it's a continuance, whether or not it's something that needs to be stipulated to, all those things come into play in, in presenting a strong appeal. Is that a, f a fair statement? I think, you know, I think justices are human. I can't say how much their personality enters into it, but it's like somebody hearing a story. Each person filters it through their own personality, so I have to think that a justice is going to see a story one way or the other based on the presentation. You know, I had, uh, I had a well-known defense attorney in Orange County when I first started practicing back in 1986 uh, concerning something that came up. He, he told me, you know, Mitch, all you have in this profession is your reputation and, and make long-term decisions with that in mind. And I think that's some of the best advice that I've ever gotten, and it sounds like it applies also uh, to appellate counsel. Donna, before we go any further, let me remind everybody that we're here today with uh, someone that's had over 30 years of, a, of appellate experience. You're a certified appellate specialist in the state of California. You've handled over 350 uh, appeals and writs, and that's why you're here today. I'd also like to ask everyone, share your questions below. We have 17 guests right now. We'll probably have hundreds more within the next couple of hours when we're done, Donna. And I'd like to ask all our guests that haven't logged into Spreecast, take just a moment, click the button on the top right, set up a 30-second account. That's all it takes. That way your picture will appear below us. That way you'll be able to ask questions during the Spreecast. And uh, if we have time, maybe even join us live on Spreecast. That might be fun. Donna, I had a friend email me uh, a question that I posted below. I copied and pasted it over. And the question says, what are the most common obstacles that you see attorneys face on appeal? Well, you told us earlier that the failure to object at the trial level is something you see during trials. Uh, but what are the obstacles on appeal that you most commonly see? Oh, I think my screen just blacked out. Can you see me? Uh, we can. You're looking good. Oh, there I am. Um, I think it went to sleep. Not that it was bored or anything, but I think my screen went to sleep. Common obstacles, are, you know, the statistics are really tough when you're the appellate. Uh, the statistics are something like a 15 to 25 percent chance of a, a reversal. So the odds are not in your favor. I mean, you wouldn't want to go to surgery with those odds. You have um, no, you, you have a presumption. Yeah, you have a presumption that the judgment is correct because if there was a presumption that judgments aren't correct, then everybody would uh, be appealing. So you know, we want to kind of filter out those people. So then you have the obstacle of you as a trial attorney creating the record, which means that record has to show the error. It has to be apparent to the Court of Appeal and not just showing the error, but you have to show that it's prejudicial. So it's kind of a two-step process for every appellate issue. The, the low rate of success for somebody on appeal, is that here in the state of California or is that a statistic that, that flows nationwide? 
I'm going to say state of California, I, I suppose I should put a little disclaimer here, is that I'm talking about general principles on appeal, and I think probably the statistics is um, similar across the nation, but I'm a California lawyer, 